So why don't we get started with uh, some opening prayer, okay? Lord Jesus, we ask you now to be with us as we accept your word into our hearts. Lord, we pray right now that we have ears to hear everything you have to say to us, Jesus. Ears to hear. And Lord, we have hearts that are open for everything you want to speak into them. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Yeah, Jesus uh, was dying on the cross and he said seven phrases while on the cross. Seven different phrases while on the cross. And so the seven weeks of this sermon series are the seven different things that Jesus said on the cross. One of the things we got to realize was the amount of pain and agony that Jesus was in when he said these things. Like if this is something where he was struggling to breathe, struggling to, uh, to get any words out. He's just in unbelievable pain. The word excruciating comes from at the cross, in the cross. So excruciating, ex cross, it's like in the cross. So they had to create a word for the kind of pain that Jesus was experiencing. So, you know, if you've ever been in pain, you can't barely talk. I remember uh, last year when I broke my ribs, you know, I was just rolling around on the ground like, a, like an animal, you know. Uh, you just can't get words out. I mean, that Jesus got these seven words out makes it more powerful, the words that he said. Right? We, so we got to look at them with a, lot of, uh, with a lot of interest because he would have struggled to have anything come out of his mouth. So to have those seven words come out means that these are very, very critical uh, things that he, that he said. So uh, our next slide here, I'd like us all to read the Bible app. It's called Last Words. If you go and you see, you see the picture here, it says, it looks like the Bible app, a little Bible. It's one of the most downloaded uh, apps for any device, whether you've got Apple or Android or whatever. Um, grab up that and then go to plans and you can see last words and we can do that together so we can all read the Bible together. Now maybe you're already reading the Bible every day. Awesome. If you're not, this would be a great way to, uh, to, to take that step to put in the Word of God. It's very simple, just a verse or two usually with, a, with an idea, devotion there. Very simple. Uh, you can get the Bible in your heart every day. All right, our next slide. On a scale from 1 to 100, how good are you? On a scale from 1 to 100, how good are you? Now, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, they're up in like the mid-90s, okay? Horrible mass murders, you know, John Wayne Gacy, whatever, like single digits, okay? Osama bin Laden, like two and a half, okay? So, on a scale from 100, how good are you? Everybody, I want you to come up with a number in your head. You don't, have to, you don't have to tell nobody, so don't worry about that. But come up with a number right now. How good are you? Put it in your head. Everybody got one? You got one? Okay. Now, we're not really sure what number it takes to be good. Is, is good where we're like plus 50? You know, if you're 50 or plus, are you a, a good person? What about the person sitting next to you? What's their number? Go ahead and judge them right now. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead and judge them right now. Look around here. Judge them. Is your number higher or lower than that person? Hmm. My wife's number is higher than mine. Ugh. Okay, so what number are you? And now judge those people next to you. What number are they, right? We don't know what the tipping mark is for being a good person. We don't know if like, oh, if it's 50 or 60, or is it 70, or, or is it 80? No, 80 seems a little high, doesn't it? 80 seems a little high. And if you gave, if you gave yourself an 80, who are you? Who do you think you are? <laughs> Goodness, great. Right. I mean, right, isn't it? Like, oh, you know, what, what number are you? I don't know, maybe we're 72 or something. That's about the number I think I'd give myself. All right, our next, our next slide. Statistics on who believes what in America that it takes to get to heaven. Now, check out these statistics from Lifeway Research. Uh, we are under the evangelical ones, by the way. When you look at these statistics, we see that 45% of Americans believe that there are many ways to heaven. 45% of Americans, it's about a half, right, believe there are many paths to heaven. And I don't know about the other... 5% or whatever, they could be agnostics or atheists that believe there is no heaven, but you know, 45% believe that there are many ways to heaven. That as long as you're a good person, you get to go to heaven. The friends, that's not what the Bible teaches. Okay, that's a belief that half of Christians 
Lifeway Research is a Christian organization. Half of Christians believe, but that's not from the Bible. So I want to make sure we're real clear on this one today, right? I don't want anybody believing stuff that's not from the Bible. Not in our church, right? I mean, if they want to be in some other church that's teaching God knows what, okay. But I mean, for us, we want to be biblically based church that everything we believe is based upon the word of God, the truth, the everlasting truth, correct? Amen. See, it has nothing to do with being good or bad. It has nothing to do with that number that we gave ourselves earlier. It has to do with being forgiven or not forgiven. Now I'm going to prove it to you today from this scripture we're going to look at. It has to do with being forgiven or not forgiven. Now, if you have Jesus in your life, you're forgiven. That's how it works. Jesus is the bridge from a broken humanity to a perfect heaven. He is the bridge. You have to walk across the bridge. There's not a bunch of different bridges. There's only the one bridge. There's not a bunch of different paths. If you're a good person, I mean, how many times I've seen funerals or heard funerals and, and it's about, oh, that person was a good person. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You heard the old story, right? There was a, there was a woman and she was a widow and they were, she was at the funeral and her and her kids are on the front row and then the man's in the casket and the preacher's up there saying, this man was a great man. He did all these things. He was a great example and all these ways. And the widow elbows her oldest son and goes, get up there and see if that's your daddy in that casket. <laughs> Uh, right? I mean, everybody's always a good person, you know. In reality, none of us are good. In reality, none of us are good. Scripture says that God alone is good. And here's how this works. Let's say you gave yourself a, a 70. Well, see, you need to be 100 to get to heaven. And here's the cool thing about Jesus. He makes your 70 100. Now, maybe you gave yourself a 25. Well, he is the 75 that brings you to 100. Now, accurate theology would say that you could, that we're actually all zeros and Jesus took our zero, our decrepit wretchedness and made us all 100. But you get what I'm saying? We're all short and Jesus makes us all 100. That's how he works. Our scripture for today, Luke chapter 23, verses 35 through 43. This is while Jesus was on the cross. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a sign was fastened above him with the words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So, you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man, Jesus, hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the second thing he said from the cross right there in verse 43. Now the death on the cross was a terrible way to die, friends. Absolutely horrible. This method of, of uh, killing someone was specifically designed, invented to be the most painful. Actually, the Romans rarely used it. They only used it in cases where they really wanted to make an example out of somebody. And what they would do is the roads that came into town, they would hang these crosses on hills as you came into town, showing you that if you mess up, you're going to be writhing on this cross. Now, most of those times it took like hours, if sometimes even days to die while being hung up there. You would be screaming for hours and days. And so as you came into town, you'd notice, don't want to mess with those guys. Man, whatever those guys did. So the, uh, the, the crucifixion on the cross was safe for people to be made an example of. Someone who was a treasonous person, who had been uh, a murderer, or someone that was leading uprisings. And it was a very clear message. Don't mess with us, because if you do, you're hanging up there too. It was horribly painful. Horribly, horribly painful. Not to be too biological, but they even had a spike. The only rest you got was to put your rear end on a spike 
And so uh, to, to hold yourself up, you would hold yourself up for as long as you could with your hands. And then the rest you got was to lower your backside into a driving spike that would, that was, you know, that's how they did that. And you'd be so exhausted, you'd go back and forth from trying to do. So uh, this is the death that Jesus Christ died for you and me. This is the sacrifice. Not only was he not a criminal, he was absolutely, totally perfect and innocent. Hmm. Our next slide. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Notice the word today. Up until that moment, the men that were being crucified with him was basically, that was the worst day imaginable, right? You have those two thieves, one who is mocking Jesus and one who's saying, remember me. You have these two thieves hanging on the cross that very day. And for that last thief, this is the worst day imaginable. All the things you've ever done, have finally been paid for. All the problems, all the things you've ever done have been paid for. Notice that in the middle of Jesus' pain, he tells this man, today you will be with me in paradise, today. Now today was a word of hope to this criminal. I'm gonna do what? Today. By the end, your suffering is about to come to an end. Your problems are about to come to an end. Today, there is a light at the end of your tunnel. There is something good happening to you. Now, Jesus, our Savior, the hero of our story, has enough spiritual insight that in the middle of all his pain, he's not thinking about himself. He's breathing hope into somebody else. Oh, man. So today you might be like, oh, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't, is my future going to be okay? Is everything going to be all right in my life? Listen, friends, he spoke hope to this hopeless situation that this man was in. In the middle of all that pain, he speaks hope. Today is your day. Tomorrow is going to be all right. You're going to be with me. Don't worry. Don't stress about a thing. Wow, I just... I'm telling you, those of you that are going through a difficult time right now, I want you to hear those words that today is your day. Today is a day for you to go ahead and breathe in the new hope that comes with Jesus. Amen. Breathe it in. Well, you don't know what I've been through, Heath. Here's some hope. By the end of today, you're, it's going to be okay. There is a light at the end of your tunnel, dear friends. And Jesus is still speaking hope into our lives even today. Our next slide, you, today you will be with me in paradise. This man was a vicious, murderous criminal. Now, the word that is used for this in, in, the, in, the, in the Luke is karkurugoy, karkurugoy, and it means vicious, evil criminal. What they probably did, when you do some research on these two guys, they would jump, they would like hide behind rocks and jump innocent people, uh, steal everything from them, kill everyone so there was no witnesses kill the men the women kill the children no witnesses they would steal and literally bandits that would jump on people and murder every witness that's who this man was and when jesus turns to him and says today you will be with me in paradise he's like me me yeah today you will be with me they were thieving murderers the worst of the worst. If they had a number, by the way, their number would be, you could count on, on one hand, the number of their goodness. They had no goodness. Notice too, this man was not a good person. This man was not water baptized. This man uh, did not live a good life. This man didn't have, you know, well, at first he was a bad person and then he made up for it. The first couple decades he was bad, but then he spent about 10 years making it right. He didn't have any of that. He had moments, that's all he had before he, of, of being good. See, Islam says if you've got more good things than bad things, then you get to go to heaven. And so Mormonism is something kind of similar. You have to be a good person. And then 45% of Christians in America believe you've got to be a good person. And I'm telling you what, this man had no way to be a good person. And Jesus tells him specifically today, you, you, my friend, you will be with me in paradise. Now, remember in those verses that we read, he said, remember me, Jesus, when you into your kingdom. There is a whole lot of theology that I really don't have time for today that goes into that statement right there. 
remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now that meant that he said, Jesus, I realize you're the Messiah because you're a king of kings, but you're about to die an earthly death. So it's kind of a Hebraic understanding that he believed he was the Messiah. The Messiah is dying right next to me, right next to me. He didn't say, if you come into your kingdom, he said, I realize who you are. And when you come into heaven, say a good word for me. He said, brother, we're going in together today. <laughs> That's so cool, isn't it? I don't know, maybe you're not grasping it today. Maybe it's not coming off today. But, but what a powerful, Jesus to be in the middle of all that pain, to be breathing hope, to be explaining to this man, listen, you're going to make it with me today. Because if you're this criminal, hell was built for people like him. Hell was created for people like him. So this guy had nothing to look forward to, right? After this painful death comes hell, eternal punishment. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Not only do you have nothing to, something to look forward to today, you're, not, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have heaven as your reward, my friend. Powerful. Our next slide here, will be with me. See, today you will be with me. Even though he betrayed everyone around him. And you get the sense that if you're a criminal like this, you don't have a lot of friends. You don't have a lot of people for you, right? If you just have killed and murdered everyone, you don't got a lot of people on your side, right? I'm going to just read into this, that this man would have had very little family, very little friends. He's just alone. And Jesus says, you're coming with me. He's like, well, I don't deserve to be with you. You're perfect. You're holy. You're righteous. Yeah, you're with me. On, you're on my team today. You're on my team today. The powerful idea of Jesus being the personal savior of our sins is that he's with us. Whatever you are going through, friends, he's with you. He's with you. Now heaven's gonna be awesome and we're about to talk about that, but listen, heaven's only great because Jesus is there. I, I, I'm, yeah, streets of gold, you can have your streets of gold. Whatever, a cabin in the woods or people think of what heaven's gonna be like, you can have all of that. I want Jesus. The thing that makes heaven heaven is not because there's streets of gold. Who cares? I want Jesus. The with me is the part of heaven that makes Jesus, makes heaven where I want to be. I want Jesus. My heart, my soul longs for that moment. Not only will you, while well, I remember you, you're coming with me today. Now, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, in paradise. Let's do that one. Let's do in paradise. Um, heaven's going to be awesome. Heaven's going to be amazing. The word paradise here is used as uh, uh, the, the Greek word is a garden, like the Garden of Eden. That's the idea. It's a wonderful, beautiful, perfect place with no problems and no sin and no anger and no stress. Not only are you going to be with me, you're going to be in paradise. This man just got a, a forgiveness that we would not have, we cannot barely understand. Now, on a personal note, I was at the dollar store yesterday. And, uh, you know, there's different dollar stores, and uh, we love our dollar stores here in these small towns. And so I was at the dollar store yesterday. Now, the aisles aren't very big at the dollar store, as you guys know. And here comes a man coming at me. I'm, I'm specifically looking for a special kind of queso cheese I like. Uh, the older I get, the more I like what I like. And... I don't know, I'm getting a little weirder, honestly, as I get older. So, uh, like, this is what I want, I want only this. And so I'm looking for this queso cheese. Here comes this man, he's got his cart, and uh, he's talking on the phone, on his cell phone with someone, he's got his cart. And, and I'm, now, I, I don't know about you, but I think we need a little understanding that the aisles of a grocery store are the same as a car's road. You have a side and another side. You don't, you don't, you don't go down the middle. Yeah, now we're finally paying attention. Like, yes, here's a sermon I can finally get behind. You stay on your side. We don't live in the UK. We live in America. Stay on your side with your cart and with your car. He's in the middle. He's coming at me. This is already kind of small. I'm, look, I'm picking up my queso. Leave me alone. Which one do I want? He's talking on the phone, which is another kind of like frustrating thing. Not even paying attention. And then he, he runs into me with his cart. 
And I'm like, ugh. And, and, and here's, the, here's the thing. He smells, he's got, his, he's got his oxygen tank and he smells just like cigarette smoke. And here's what, here's what I, I immediately judged him, friends. I immediately judged him. <sighs> this guy's running into me. He's obviously smoking and he's got his oxygen. So, I mean, obviously the doctors have told him to stop. This is killing you. And he just continues on. And I was just, I mean, all these thoughts just come at you in an instant. Just. And man, the Lord just rebuked me, friends. Here you are about to preach a sermon on the number and goodness and the grace and the mercy of God and how this man that was dying on the cross would have been the worst possible individual and your spirit of judgmentalism is just all over me. Hmm. So foolish of me to think that I'm a better number than anybody else. Who are we? Who are we, friends? We're all, who cares? So I'm a 55. And this guy's not, who cares? Who am I? Who are we? Let's just be so thankful and grateful for the, what Jesus has done for us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> that story flipped fast. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to judge anybody. I don't want to be that person. Because I am that man on the cross. And it's my sin that put the innocent Messiah to death that day. And you might be a good person. You might not be a good person. Guess what? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Our application slide today. Let's stop comparing ourselves to other people, Heath. And let's be very thankful for the sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross. Let's just stop comparing ourselves. Whatever number you gave yourself, it's just, we're, we're all admitting it's a far cry from where we need to be. Let's not judge anybody else. I don't know what this man was going through. I don't know what issues he had. He might want to desperately stop smoking and, and can't seem to pull it together. And I don't, who am I to judge him? We all have things we can't seem to pull together, right? I want to stop comparing myself to anybody else. Because as soon as I think I'm better than them, that's my sin. As soon as I think I'm lower than them, then I'm going to be jealous of them. And I don't want any of that. We don't want any of that. Amen? Amen. So we're going to stop comparing ourselves and we're going to be thankful for what Jesus has done for you and me. Right? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like this guy. Like me. It's personal. I once was lost and now I'm found. Once was blind, couldn't see, didn't know things, and now I can see. If I could have every head bowed, please, and every eye closed in prayer right now. We're going to pray right now, friends.